on my head, you can put oil on my chest, you can put crystals down my back. You can lay the Bible on me every time I go to sleep. You cannot change me. It's an inside job. I must want to be changed and then be willing to do the work that is necessary in order for me to be changed. Where's my book? Reverend Coleman says, we need to start at the beginning and understand just what is prayer. She says prayer is rising out of mere human thought, which limits you and limits God. Prayer is rising up in consciousness, moving up to the level of God's light of truth. I want you to take the time to think seriously about it, she says. All prayer is a movement in mind. All prayer is a movement in mind. You have to take responsibility for your prayer life and the results that you are getting. You have to take responsibility. If your prayers are not being answered, you have nobody to blame but you. Because until you move your mind, the problem stays the same. Does that make sense? It's like getting on the elevator and standing there waiting to get to the 96th floor and you didn't push the button. <laughs> and praying one thing and behaving another way as the pastor. <laughs> Some of y'all still didn't get the story. <laughs> <laughs> you pray and 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 as soon as you finish praying, you go back to trying to fix it. Hmm? So do you want God to do it, or do you want to do it? I mean, that's the question. That's the question. Now, does prayer have a purpose? On page two, she says, why pray at all? Well, most of us think the purpose of prayer is to change God, and we were hard at trying to change God. But this is not the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is to change me. That's the only reason why I pray. The purpose of prayer is to, be, to become consciously aware of my oneness with God. I know that blows everybody's prayer life out of the water because we have all learned that prayer is taking your Christmas list to God. <laughs> gimme, 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 gimme. Give me, give me, give me. I ain't going to do nothing to deserve it. Just give me, give me, give me. I'm not going to do anything more than what I'm doing, but yeah. There's a lot of words that we use, isn't it? We've been taught that a whole lot of words. And some places where some of you have come from, you had to learn those words verbatim. Mm -hmm. Right down the line. You couldn't mess up. Uh-huh. If you were supposed to be on the first bead, you couldn't be on the sixth bead. Because it's a word to go with the first bead. It's a word to go with the second bead. It's a word to go with the third bead. It's a word to go with the fourth bead. But you ain't got no answers. Why would you keep doing something that does not bring you results? Hmm? Come on, talk to me, somebody. Is anybody in here? So maybe you need to get in a class. <laughs> but today we're talking about how to make prayer personal. Where's my book? On page four, Reverend Coleman says, you've got a personal God. And sometimes when you pray, you don't need a whole lot of words. Prayer is more than words. It's a deep feeling. When you are really in touch, you don't even have to open your mouth. Ooh, I like that. When you are really in touch with the presence that is within you, you don't need any words. You say, I'm one with it. Is that what you say? Is that what your mouth says? Uh-huh. But she is purporting in this book that our mouth says a whole lot of things, but our heart is still the same. Hmm? If 
you want prayer to be personal, then you have to have a personal relationship to the one to whom you pray. I'll wait. Come on. Personal prayer requires a personal relationship with the one to whom you pray. In the 22nd chapter of Job, scripture says, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Two people knew it. Acquaint means to become familiar with. Hmm? To have something in connection with. At least to be on speaking terms. Most of us don't think about praying until the kid gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. As long as things are going along fine, you know, we get up in the morning, put on Oprah and care, you know, keep on going. They told me the girl paid her bills, $68,000 million or whatever it was for closing up Chicago. Uh-huh, uh-huh. If you're praying for your bills to be paid, you got to put some money in the bank. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's another whole class. <laughs> but if it was possible for money to fall out the ceiling because you raise your hands and say certain words, we'd all be rich, wouldn't we? Uh huh. The thirty-first Psalm says, "I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God." You can't or you won't be able to let go and let God until you acquaint yourself with your God and trust your God enough to release it all to your God and be at peace with the fact that you released it. You can't and you won't do that until you trust your God. Now, everyone can say, I trust in God, but not everyone can say, I trust God. Trust implies a firm belief, a confident expectation. The verb to trust means to commit into the care of. Hmm? If you trust your God, then you commit into his care whatever it is that you are concerned about. Now, if I commit my baby into Dolores' care, I leave it there and I go on off the birth. Hmm? Whatever your situation is, you're going to have to take it to your God and leave it there. Hmm? To trust also means to expect help from. To trust means to fall back on with no doubt and no reservations. But if after you pray, you begin to have reservations, then you're not trusting. Just trying to get a little understanding here today. If after Reverend so-and-so prays for you, after you paid Sister Cleo, Is she still in business? <laughs> after all of that is done, after you've been everywhere that you can think of to go, after you have done everything that you knew how to do and everything that someone else has advised you to do, when you have run out of resources 
And when your back is up against the proverbial brick wall, probably then, and only then, will you let go and trust God. To